So we're ready to restart. So what we have seen is the prehistory of Ethernet. And there's practically very, very few systems that use that form of Ethernet. But there are many systems that use a variant of this on radio channels, uh, Wi-Fi being the most widespread examples, or on power line cables, or on Internet of Things, Zigbee, uh, 802.14, and uh, that kind of things. But still, we need to discuss what is the Ethernet that we use today? What is the Mac layer uh, that is on, on the wired systems? Right? In particular, in what is called Ethernet today, there is no CSMA protocol and no uh, shared medium, in fact. To understand why, uh, it's simpler to go if we go through history. So as soon as that's, this was invented, it was invented by uh, companies like Digital, Xerox in, in the 70s, people find out it didn't, doesn't work well. And the uh, main reason it uh, doesn't work well is Imogene. You are the somewhere managers of infrastructure at TPFL, and we have to cable the computers like this. So you have to pull uh, cab uh, analog uh, digital cable that goes through all building or rooms of a building, for example. And then people come inside the building and they wiretap something into, into the cable. Right? Uh, it's very easy to do a, a lab prototype in a room, but the kind of things that can go wrong is what happens if one of those cables is damaged for whatever reason. Then it can create, for example, reflections in the cable. And reflections mean there will be interference and the system will not work. The system will not work because of uh, analog problems. So analog problems are very bad. I mean, anything digital is not so good, doesn't work so well, it's full of bugs, but it's easy to understand what happens in the analog world. When the problem like this happens, you had to send somebody on their bicycle with uh, uh, an analog meter or an interferometer or some kind of systems that will analyze the cable you need to connect it here, and uh, it can take days. And while you're doing that, the network doesn't work. So it's a bad idea. It's a research prototype. It's not something that the industry wants. So the people who commercialized Ethernet system, the first thing they invented was called the hubs. So the, what are the hubs? Well, the idea of a hub is, no, you don't do this. We do that for you. What is a hub? Well, a hub is the same, but except all the connectors are inside the box. And you connect to the box with something which is, can be nicely screwed. And now if something goes wrong, well, it can either be the box, in which case we replace the box, or the box is less likely to go wrong than the cables that go everywhere in everyone's mess in their office. And if the problem is the lobe here, the attachment cable, then we can disconnect it. And if we see if disconnecting solves the problem, then we see where the problem came from. These were the, the first hubs, so it's, it's a stupid thing. I mean, apart from this, we are still have the sh same shared medium Ethernet as before, uh, except this cable here now has a, a possibility of being disconnected. Very quickly, the industry invented something better, which is to make the hub electronic instead of purely passive. So an electronic hub is functionally the same, but here, instead of having a physical connection where you drill into the coax, you simply have some electronic that receives the signal and repeats it on the, on the backbone of the hub. The main advantage is, because it's electronic, you can remotely manage it, and in particular, disconnect a lobe if something goes wrong. This was called an active hub. In our terminology, an active hub is uh, a repeater is a, net, a box full of repeaters. So this white box is a repeater. Repeater is, in some sense, an intermediate system of layer one. So it takes a signal that represents one bit for the old Ethernet, a, few, a group of symbols of several bits for more modern Ethernets, and goes from the analog domain to the, some kind of digital domain and re generates it to send it on this uh, system here. So it takes really, it breaks the medium. In particular, this could be optical fiber and this could be coax or vice versa. But it's all physical layer stuff. There is no understanding of a frame or anything here. 
So the terminology is a hub. A hub today, I mean, this terminology is very shaky, but the strict terminology is that one. A hub is really a physical layer set of uh, repeaters. Then, as um, incidentally, when people did that, they found that using coax cable here is a bad idea, and what people did was instead to use uh, telephone kind of cable, twisted pairs. Why do we use coax cable? What's the motivation for that? The loss, the loss is one, but there's a much worse phenomenon. I mean, when you send a signal on, on a cable, uh, this cable becomes an antenna. And as you know, the laws, the Maxwell equations, both always work both ways. So if you're an antenna, that means you emit, but you also receive. Yes? Pardon me? L'effet de peau. No, that's something different. That's some, something. The skin effect is the fact that uh, uh, high frequency uh, signals navigate at the surface of a conductor. It has nothing to do with it. So a coax cable is a, is a cable, uh, not like this one. This is a twisted pair. A coax cable is a cable where we have one conductor, and around this conductor, there's a second conductor that is a cylinder around. I'm sure you remember from your tender years when you studied electromagnetisms that if you have a cylinder, it becomes a Faraday cage. All the external uh, waves cannot get inside if you have an infinitely long cylinder. Because the, uh, if you look at the partial differential equations of Maxwell's law, then the, uh, it's impossible to have a solution that goes inside. So a coax is a way, it's called shielding. You put a coax, that means a conductor, around the cable. It's a way to isolate this cable from all the waves that come from the outside. And what are the waves that come from the outside? Typically, it's other cables like you. So you put a cable here, but probably if you put one cable, there's another one. The signal of the other cable radiates if you don't shield it, if you don't protect it. Your cable works as an antenna, so the signal go from one wire to the next. This is exploited in power line communication, for example. In power line communication, we want the signal to go from one to the next, uh, because, for example, you're not necessarily always on the same uh, phase in your basement and the top of your house. But if you allow this, you, have a, you receive a lot of interference, and also you, you radiate a lot of, of your signal. So there's a large loss and a large interference, which means it works on very, very short distances, but it doesn't work very long, it doesn't work on meters. Uh, a cheap way of solving the problem is twisting your uh, pair. You need two wires to transmit a signal. If you twist it, twisting means that you create loops that are counter to each other and then the signal that is radiated and received by the loop are opposite of each other from one loop to the next loop. So since they are very, if they are well twisted, the loops are very close, so they almost cancel each other. So it's not as good as shielding with a, an outside coating, but it is a, a cheap solution. And this is how telephone cables and most ethernet cables are today. Sometimes you also have twisted cable in which you add uh, a shield around. This is, uh, I would say, very common uh, Ethernet systems. Now, coax cable, I don't know if you've tried to install uh, the thick coax cable in your, for someone, for TV, etc. They are very painful. See, they, they are not easy to bend. Uh, they are not, so it's, uh, I would say, electrical techniques uh, problem, but that played a role here. The end of this is that um, it, it was very interesting to use those kind of cable. Now, those kinds of cable are much less good than uh, coax cable, and they are typically not used for multiple transmissions. Although Apple Talk did it, uh, but it works only for very low bit rate and very short distances. So, in practice, we use them only for point to point communication. And to make the thing even simpler, this is a typical twisted pair. It has two pairs, which means four wires, one for one direction and the other pair for the reverse direction. 
so that you have, in fact, two wires, one from B to the hub, one from the hub to B. And by having two opposite wires, you have two channels that interfere a bit, but not too much. So if the cable length is not too long, you have a nice point-to-point -point, uh, cable. And that is much easier to use. The plug is smaller, everything is nicer. So this is what very quickly Ethernet became. You have an active hub here that still does this uh, uh, repetition that I said before, but the connection is over a twisted pair. That still means that if A is sending a signal, uh, is sending a message, a packet, A sends it over the twisted pair, the signal is repeated electronically here, propagates in the entire hub, now it's repeated in the reverse direction by all the repeaters, and the packet is, in fact, sent from A to B and C. Now, if C sends at the same time, there will be no collision on the wire between C and the repeater, but the repeater here will create the collision, because the repeater repeats what was sent by A to C, and is now sending the signal sent by C. So, from a practical viewpoint, it's just a cabling difference, but we still have a shared medium inside the box here. Now, it's not easy to see that, of course, it is stupid. I mean, you, if you think about what you've achieved, you have a shared medium mechanism, but how do you use it? You put it in a box, and then you connect to this box by telephone cables. So, in fact, what you have is a telephone what if you would replace this by a telephone switch or by something that does not have the collisions? And the answer is yes, we can do it, uh, but it's not, a, it's not a telephone switch, although it is called a switch. A switch means any device that is in a box and forwards packet from the inside to the outside, and most of the time it means at the speed of hardware. Here we're talking of layer two switch, or more precisely, Bridge. Bridge is the function that it does when we think of it from a protocol viewpoint. Once you have your things connected to this box, well, instead of having this CSMA CD protocol inside the box, what you can do is put a switch inside the box. What is a switch? Well, a switch is something that can be done in software or hardware. If it's done in software, it is simply something that has a processor that reads all the data that is received. So you put a buffer at the end of each of the, of the lines. Instead of putting just a repeater, you put a frame buffer. So you receive a packet, then when it's received, you put it in the buffer, and you raise an interruption somewhere to say to the processor that one packet is available here. And then the processor will simply read all the buffers, perhaps in round robin fashion, one after the other, and send them to the appropriate output. How can it know where, which output? by looking at the MAC address. So it will look at the MAC address, and if it's a packet for C, it will put in the queue for C. And now it is the physical layer logic that will read the packets from this queue to C here. This is a software switch. Uh, the switches that you have today do the same, but in hardware, instead of having a software running on Linux, for example, you have a dedicated FPGA or some kind of hardware that will do the same function uh, on and on and forever. This is called a bridge. Another way to look at what a bridge does is that a bridge separates collision domains. So bridges were invented at the origin more perhaps in this scenario. Assume you have three ethernets, the pink areas, and you would like to make them only one. So one thing you can do is you can extend the cable here, and you can put a T connector there. So it is one single big cable where all the signal propagates. You could do that. To, if you do that, you have to make sure that the total cable length is not too long. But the main difference is, if I put a bridge now instead, the main difference is that the collision domains are separated which practically means that inside each of the pink area, there can be one transmission at a time. For example, it is possible for A to send data to B. That will uh, occur here. And for E to send packet to F, those two things can happen in parallel. Because if that happens, uh, the bridge 
How does a bridge work? I showed a very simple case of a bridge, which is just at the end of the point-to-point -point cables. Here, the bridge is more complicated. The bridge is connected to an Ethernet shared medium segment, but it works the same way. The bridge reads all the packets that are visible on the, on the cable, so it works like a packet sniffer. It's called promiscuous mode. It reads everything, analyzes the destination MAC address, and if it finds that the destination MAC address is not on the cloud where it's coming from, it will forward to the other port. For example, if A sends a packet to F, it will send it on the Ethernet with MAC address destination F. The bridge will see, oh, there is a packet with destination F. Somehow the bridge needs to know that F is on the port number three, and therefore it will send it on port number three. But while doing that, of course, if all traffic is between A and F, then they are in collision, but if there's a lot of traffic from A to B, from D to C, and from E to F, to F, at least that traffic does not compete with each other. It will cause some work in the bridge, but on the pink networks, they can be happening in parallel. Bridges need the table to know where the destinations are, so they need a forwarding table, which is not like an IP routing table, because it's a table that says where a given MAC address is. Now, MAC addresses have no meaning apart from the identity of the manufacturer, but they don't say where the system is, so they are practically impossible to aggregate. So the match is an exact match. So this bridge, for example, has a table with A, B, C, D, E, F, those are the MAC addresses, and the ports on which they are. Right. How does a MAC address, how, how is this table built? In IP routers, you have done some configuration already and you will do more. We need to configure the router. We will see a bit later that there are automatic ways to do that. DHCP is one of them for the next hop. Routing protocols are the other way to find all the entries in routers, routing tables. Bridges don't do that. Bridges don't have routing protocols at least the standard bridges. There are bridges that are a bit uh, more special that have the equivalent of routing protocols, but the standard bridges, they learn by sniffing traffic. So a bridge listens to all traffic on all ports. And, uh, sorry, no, I will, uh, yes. In the MAC uh, frame, in the MAC packet, there is, of course, the destination MAC address, but also the source MAC address, which is used, as we have seen, uh, to avoid doing ARP when you receive a packet for someone, for example. This is also used by the bridge for learning. So when A sends a packet, sooner or later, if A is alive, it will send a packet. Practically all systems send packets. There are very few systems that only receive. There are some, but they're extremely rare. So A will send a packet. The bridge listens to everything. So A will see the packet. Perhaps it's a packet sent to B. The bridge in principle shouldn't do anything, but it will read it. By reading it, it will learn something. It will learn that a packet, somebody has sent a packet with MAC address A, source MAC address A, on port one. From that, the bridge will learn and will decide that MAC address A is on port one, so we'll write this entry. Similar, if a packet is sent someday by E, then it will send it, it will be visible on port three. So sooner or later, as soon as one of those system, each of those six systems has sent one packet, the bridge will know where they are. If, for some reason, uh, A sends a packet to F before F could ever send something, there's a default rule in that case, the bridge will send it to all ports. It will do a broadcast. So if A sends a packet to F and bridge doesn't know where F is, it will send it to all ports, except of course the ports that it comes from, because if it comes from this port, uh, this is supposed to be a multicast uh, broadcast domain. Uh, if F would be here, it would have received it. So it would in that case send it to port two and three. So this is how standard bridges work. They use an exact table, and they learn by observing traffic. So, before we continue, a quick question. 
here is a network where I have four boxes. Three of them are hubs, so old style uh, cabling systems. The one in the middle can be configured either as a hub or a switch. How many frames can be transmitted in parallel in either case? I close in five seconds. And the vast majority says B, which is the correct answer. Whoops. Is the correct answer here because it could be more than, th so certainly what is, if this is a hub, well, a hub is just a cabling system. It's as if I had a single shared medium cable, so only one frame can be transmitted in parallel. It's a mutual exclusion principle that's applied. Now, if this is a bridge, then on each of those domains, uh, things happen separately now. Because those domains are connected by hubs and not bridges, that means there can be also one frame in each of those domains separately. So in total, there can be only three. So this is where we are. We have invented uh, bridges that can perhaps replace the concentrators and be better. Now the next invention was a demolition, if you want. We have removed uh, things, application of the Occam's razor on the principle that less is more. That's a principle you should apply to all your uh, programming efforts. When you've done something, then try to remove uh, to make it even better. Now, imagine you, you have a box, right, to which you can connect uh, with twisted pair cables. And this box is a switch. Then, in principle, the access between you and the box should use CSMACD. That means CSMACD means you prevent collisions. But you prevent collisions between whom and whom? Well, between you and the switch. Because if everyone is connected by their own dedicated pair to the switch, which is the standard Ethernet cabling today, the only collisions that could occur is between the guys on the same cable, which is you and the switch. When you talk to someone else, they're in a different collision domain. They're separated by the switch, which is a bridge, uh, acting as a bridge. Now, if in addition you have twisted pair cables that allow transmission and reception on different wires that do not cause a collision when the two uh, transmissions are happening in parallel, then there is no collision. There's no need for collision. Right? So you can, if there's no collision, there's no need for um, an exclusion protocol. There's no need for CSMA. And it's called full duplex Ethernet. Full duplex means you send on a system, typically a cable, in both directions at the same time. Duplex means both can send. A half duplex means you both can send, but not speaking at the same time. So a shared medium Ethernet cable is a half duplex system. Duplex because it works in both directions, but half because not at the same time. So full duplex Ethernet simply means we forget those beautiful things that have caused many papers to be published. Uh, we remove CSMACD and we do simply a uh, simplistic thing. You connect by different wires for the reverse and the direct communication to a switch, to a bridge. And the bridge doesn't cause collision because it's a buffered system. It is a queuing system. A bridge can still have problems. What kind of problems? When two domains send to one domain, so if you have two sources that send to the same output, there will be a conflict, but there is a buffer. So one of the packets will be served first, the second will be buffered. So if it happens only once, it will cause a delay. That's a queuing system. If it happens consistently, like you are streaming video at 10 megabit per second from 10 sources to the same output port, and the output port is also at 10 megabit per second, this cannot last forever. So the buffer will fill. They will get full at some point because the input rate is 10 times larger than the output rate. And sooner or later, the buffers will overflow. 
So there will be losses. In any queuing system on the internet, there can be packet losses. So in bridges, there might be packet losses. We will need to do something against the losses, and that will be the goal of congestion control. This is typically not solved by the bridges themselves, although some bridges implement some back pressure mechanism, but typically they don't do it. The reasons most of the time being that the, you try to avoid this thing I said. I mean, if you have 10 things that stream at 10 megabit, per, at one megabit, at, let's say at 10 megabit per second, then if, if that happens, if there's a concentration here, you'll try to have a, an output port speed that is larger. You will put a one gigabit per second port uh, at this direction here. So typically, bridges in cabling system are very, very high speeds, and so congestion is not much of an issue there. But on Wi-Fi networks, you find these problems when you have complex networks with uh, many base stations and bridges in between. You may have those problems. You may have to design the network, and you have to make sure there is congestion control happening with, typically at the transport layer of the internet. I've shown so far one bridge. Of course, you would like to be able to have more than one for practical reasons if you have a house with three floors, perhaps you want to put one bridge at every floor and interconnect them uh, together. And this is possible because uh, the method of forwarding works. For example, if I observe bridge three, whenever X sends some packet, uh, bridge B1 has observed it. And uh, if it's, uh, it will know that uh, it comes on this port. If this packet is forwarded, it will reach bridge 3 and port 1. So bridge 3 will see X as present on port 1 and will see uh, C, for example, as present on port 2. So you can combine bridges, at least on, on this example. Will it always work? I close in five seconds. The majority says A, uh, but in that case, the majority is wrong. So it's like a votation in February two years ago. Exceptionally, uh, well, this was a, a trick. The problem is the loops. It works well, if, but you have to make sure if you want this to work, you have to make sure you have a tree in your topology, you have no loop. Because, I mean, this is a picture taken from the book, that, but we can, from any other book, we can see easily. I mean, the bridge is trying to learn on which port uh, this guy is. But if there are multiple ways uh, that you can reach uh, this bridge, then it will oscillate between the two. So, for example, assume the bridge has a packet sent by A with destination address B. At the beginning, it doesn't know, so it will send it on all ports. It will broadcast to port two and three, so the packet will arrive here, will arrive there. So this switch two will think that A is on port one. Switch three will think that A is on port one. But switch three will do the same thing. It will broadcast this packet because it still doesn't know where the destination is. It will send it to switch two and to not to switch one back because it knows uh, it's coming from here. S but switch two will now have two information. This comes from port three and port one. Of course, we can say the information on port one came first, but we're not guaranteed that this will happen in this order because bridges are queuing systems, so there might be random delays, and when a packet is sent, it might be that by bad luck, this one comes here. And also, the next time it will come, it will be different. So there will be non-consistent information on where the addresses are. So the principle of learning, which is principle applied by uh, bridges requires that a special condition and special condition is that the topology has no loop. Now, topology that has no loop is a tree, that's a synonym. So that means that bridges must be connected in the way such that the topology is a tree or at least the active topology is a tree. 
Of course, if we require that the physical topology is a tree, this is too restrictive. Most of the time, we want to avoid tree. I mean, trees have no loop, therefore, so they have no backup path. If you have cabled your system as a tree, and one of the link, links is broken, then your, your network is partitioned into two. The network doesn't work anymore. So when you build a network, the first thing you think about is to try if it's an important network, if it's a backbone, if it's your ADSL modem network at home, perhaps you don't care, but if it's the backbone of EPFL, you want it to have some redundancy. A simple way to do redundancy is to do a ring, for example. But the ring, of course, has loops. So any good network topology will have loops. The way bridges handle this case is by running what is called the spanning tree protocol. So all the bridges, when you connect them, if they are standard bridges, which means if they run the spanning tree protocol, which normal bridges do, they talk to each other and they agree on a tree. The way they agree on the tree is they elect the best bridge, which is the most beautiful one, which is typically uh, in a flat network, it's a random choice. If you have a ring that's completely have a circular symmetry, it can be any one. If it's a network that has some structure, it is meshed, but it has a core, for example, the, the, the root will be one bridge of the core, so you can give priorities to the bridges to uh, force them. Uh, to, to know who will be the core. The way they do it is by comparing the labels of the bridges, which are the name, and they pick whoever is the, bridge, is the bridge with the smallest label. And then they compute shortest path trees from every bridge to the root. And, for example, the shortest path trees are the one here. And then the links that are not on the shortest path tree are disabled by disabling one of the ports. So, for example, at switch 9, which has two ways to reach this, this and that, it will disable this one, which is the longer, perhaps. So in this bridge network, three ports will be disabled. This is done in the case of the standard bridges in a completely distributed and autonomous way by the bridges themselves. They will uh, break those three ports here. Not break, but deactivate them. So it is as if the cable here is disconnected at this end. Of course, the bridges will continue monitoring uh, the state of the network, so they will still send ping packets here, for example, and there. And if this line gets broken, for example, that would disconnect the tree, they will recognize that the line is broken and will recompute a new spanning tree uh, if one is possible. So we will get almost the best of both worlds. We will have a topology that has redundancy but only redundancy in the sense of backup. If we have a ring, for example, the ring will be broken somewhere and the active topology will be a line, not a ring. But the ring is here in case in backup. In case one of the links fails, a new line will be constructed that will connect all the nodes together. But it's not, it's in backup as opposed to, there are multiple ways of doing redundancy. You can do it in backup or in load sharing. Load sharing would mean all the links are used for carrying traffic and you split the traffic as equally as possible or according to some other mechanisms. And if you lose some of the links, then the other ones are still able to carry traffic. Here, the bridges do not share, do not use the, uh, the backup. So here, for example, this line is not used at all. It's wasted. It's, they are just in case. So this is the state of the art today. This is how Ethernet is made today. Um, Ethernet cables uses primarily bridges that are typically called switches, layer two switches, because sometimes people call a router a layer three switch. Um, hubs, which are pure repeaters, uh, exist in very, very rare cases. Practically, they are, if you go to Migro or MediaMark, you will not be able to find one. Um, but an important thing to realize, in particular to understand how bridging and other protocols work, is bridges are required to be transparent. If you remember how bridges came, they came as a better way of doing a hub, which meant 
that they had to be better, but also not more complicated. So if I replace a hub by a bridge, from a protocol viewpoint, there's no difference. Of course, you hope there's a difference in terms of performance. If I have a hub, the different ports are all in the same college domain. If I have a switch, the different ports are in not in the same collision domain. They can uh, transmit frames in parallel. So they are not transparent from the viewpoint of performance, but they are transparent from the viewpoint of protocols. This is why we say that a bridge is transparent. It means in particular, if I send a packet from A to B and it's forwarded by a bridge, whether there is a bridge or whether A and B are directly connected by ethernet cable, I mean, you can try that, you can connect your PC to your neighbor's PC directly with an ethernet cable. Sometimes you need to be careful to pick the right cable. But whether you do that or you go through one bridge or one a network of 200 bridges, from a protocol viewpoint, it's exactly the same way. There's no way by doing ping or any kind of things that you would see a difference. Again, how many questions? But now I have switches everywhere. I close in five seconds. And the correct answer is D more than six in the worst case or in the best case? So, well, because we have switches everywhere, right? So even if the cable, well, probably the cables are full duplex, but even if they would be half duplex, you could have one frame here, one frame there, one frame there at the same time. It could happen that the three systems are send sending to this switch. If the cables are full duplex, there can even be one in each direction here, so there can be six in this part. At the same time, if they are full duplex, three if they are half duplex. And the same for each of those things. So if the cables are half duplex, they can be nine. If they are full duplex, they can be 18. But the correct answer is larger than six, anyhow. Right. Of course, this is assuming extremely local traffic, which is very atypical. In most networks, traffic is concentrated, but uh, in, in the worst case, this is what could happen. So this is how Ethernet is today. When you connect to an Ethernet system, you probably are connected to something like this. Right. Here is uh, the most <coughs> frequent Ethernet format. I say the most frequent because there are several formats. In fact, there are two. Uh, there are two formats for an Ethernet frame, which, but that all adapters understand. Uh, the simplest to reason about is this one. It's called the Ethernet format. The other one is called the IEEE format. They differ, but okay, you can easily find the differences on Wikipedia. Uh, this one is easier, so I use it. Uh, this is the Ethernet header, and whatever is contained in the internet is here in pink, and in principle, uh, the Mac layer doesn't care about what's inside. Typically, what's inside is what? Well, it is an IP packet, IPv4, IPv6, or an R packet. The type here is a pointer to what is inside. So inside is, for example, IPv4 or IPv6. ARP, as we have seen, it should be part of IPv4, but is in fact treated as a separate protocol. And then there's a zillion, a zoo of uh, lots of protocols that we practically never see, uh, with a few exceptions. We will talk, at least some of you who will do the research exercise, will talk of MPLS, and uh, we'll talk about it uh, last week of the course. The time protocol is a protocol that is used to do high precision of NTP, is a protocol that's used to uh, adjust the clock of your computer or your smartphone. If, but it's not very accurate. It has an accuracy of a fraction of a second, which is good enough for uh, knowing when this course ends and starts. But it's not good enough if you're doing high precision physics at CERN, for example, or smart grid monitoring here at EPFL or otherwise. So you have, in that case, uh, dedicated hardware 
special switches that measure, for example, how much time they spend processing a packet. So, but those are industrial type of environment. The principle, the main type we will see here is IPv4 or IPv6. The fact that IPv4 and IPv6 are treated as different protocol is really a symptom of the problem with IPv6. IPv6 is not another version of IPv4. It is really a different protocol. If it would be another version of IPv4, there would be here no Ethernet type for IPv6. There would be IP, and within IP, there is a version number. But that's not the way it's done here. We have here destination and source address that we've mentioned, the type. And at the end, there is a, a small code. Uh, it's a redundancy code, 32 bits, that are here to uh, protect the data against bit errors, which are typically due to transmission errors. So it's able to uh, correct single bit errors, and, but in practice, you don't. So if you receive a packet and the frame check sequence, the last feed is incorrect, there has been a transmission error, and in principle, you discard it. You don't deliver packets that are incorrect. Because a single bit error could mean, for example, an error in the IP address. Right. Voila, that's all for today. We will continue tomorrow for the lab and next week. <laughs>